time ago. I can still Hello and welcome to our podcast that we are calling a political primer. We wanted to talk about the origins of the two major political parties in the U.S. and how this system works, but allows us to elect many of our represented officials in our U.S. government. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. So in effect, the U.S. has a two-party system. And what we mean by that is most political races that are going on are dominated by two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Interesting, the Constitution doesn't say anything about political parties. And basically, our first president warned against them. He thought they were a bad idea. But as new ideas came out, as history rolled on, our nation has fundamentally formed into a two-party system. Once you become a voter, you will see that there are many parties out there. And this becomes exceptionally obvious when you go to vote, especially for the office of president every four years. You will see that there are Democrats and Republicans on that ticket, but there are many other parties along the way. What we mean by a two-party system is, in effect, these are the only two parties that consistently win the big elections. There are certainly the Green Party, the Libertarians, the Constitutionalists, all kinds of different parties that are out there. But in effect, the Democrats and the Republicans tend to dominate most elections. So where do these two parties come from? The Democratic Party comes from the idea of democracy, which is rule by the people. And this evolved from the Democratic Republican Party of Thomas Jefferson. But the first president who was strictly a Democratic Party president was that of Andrew Jackson. The Republicans, on the other hand, are basically named for the idea of a republic, the idea of rule through representatives. And this group emerged in the 1850s, and the first Republican president was Abraham Lincoln of 1860. They also have the name of the GOP. It's not pronounced GOP. It's an acronym that stands for the Grand Old Party. So if we're talking about politics, we can be saying the Republicans or the GOP, and those would be the same party. Now, in terms of what the Democrats and the Republicans used to stand for and what they stand for now, there are exceptionally interesting historical shifts that have gone on. But for right now, we just kind of need to know where these names came from. And as we go through our course and see our discussions about government evolve, we'll talk more and more about where these parties used to stand and how they have changed up to today. So the reason we're talking about these two major parties is that we are looking at how does one gain the presidency. And so what are the steps to becoming a president? In effect, there are many steps. It's not like somebody just simply signs up at their local YMCA and the next day they're president. We're going to see many steps go into this process. Additionally, we're going to see that this process begins earlier and earlier every time there's a presidential election. So at the time we're making this podcast, the next election on the horizon is 2016, but we're making it in 2014, and there are already people talking about potentially running for president in two years' time. It seems like our nation has been transformed in a nation of constant politicking and basically shooting for that office of president. Additionally, as we're going to see, seeking the presidency is exceptionally expensive. In terms of all the travel that is needed in order to meet with all these people, in terms of buying ads on the radio, on TV, via internet. And so one must question, can the ordinary American actually rise to this office anymore? Or are we becoming somewhat of an oligarchy, ruled by the few, where basically only the wealthy have a serious chance of becoming president? So step one of running for the presidency is to basically throw one's hat in the ring, in effect, it's an old boxing term that basically says, yeah, I'm in. I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. I like the next fight. And so candidates for the office of president, or for any office for that matter, basically throw their hat into the ring and declare their intention to run for that office. Once those candidates have thrown their hats into the ring, there's probably going to be the need for primary elections. And so what we mean by this is there are probably going to be many people from each of the two parties that are interested in running for president from that party. So there's going to be many Democrats who are interested in running for president. There's going to be many Republicans who are interested in running for the Republicans. And so our system is designed to narrow down these many candidates into one candidate from each party. And these are called the primary elections. And so in 
each of the 50 states, there is some process that is going to be used in order to say, here are the multiple Democrats running. Who do you want to see be the one Democrat running for office? And the same for the Republican side. And so this will, in effect, decide how many delegates will represent each candidate at the national convention, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so in many states, we actually have primary elections. People from each party go to the polls and they cast a vote for their primary election. So Democrats in, say, Iowa would go and vote for the Democrat of their choice. And so all of the Iowa Democrats get to vote for which Democrat they'd like to see is the one that will represent their party in the general election in November. And this is the same for the Republican side as well. Now, some states have what we call caucuses, where basically people don't go in and vote for the person they want. They go into kind of like town meetings or you know, neighborhood meetings, and they get together and say, okay, here's 100 Democrats all hanging out. Who do we want to represent us? And they chat and talk about it and pros and cons and that kind of stuff. And then these caucuses say, we want person X to represent our party. And the Republicans may do the same in a state that uses caucuses rather than primary elections. As these primary elections are going on, there are probably going to be primary debates. So, for example, here is a picture of all the Republicans who are running in the Republican primaries before the 2012 election. These are all Republicans campaigning against each other, debating against each other, in order to be the one Republican that would be on the ticket for the November general election. And so it's very interesting to watch these because you see that all of these people are members of the same party, but they're kind of combating each other, saying, no, I'm more conservative. No, I'm more liberal on this issue. No, I think I could represent the party best on national defense or taxes or immigration or whatever the issues are at any one time. And so eventually, while we have seven people on the screen here, one person is going to emerge from these primaries, these primary debates, primary elections, and become the one candidate for the Republican Party. And the same thing is potentially happening on the Democratic side. So step four, once we've had these primary elections or caucuses and primary candidates have shared their views through all of these debates, each party is going to have a national convention. And this is where the party gets together and makes a formal nomination for one candidate to run for the office of president from their party. So for example, in 2012, the Republicans had their convention in Tampa Bay, and they formally nominated Mitt Romney to run for the office of president. The Democrats, also in 2012, renominated Barack Obama. Because remember, he had been elected in 08, and 2012 was his re-election campaign. Although he did need to be formally renominated by his party to be the Democratic nominee. Now at the national convention, this is where the presidential nominee is probably going to choose his or her running mate. And it may not be at the convention. In modern times, the running mate is oftentimes chosen way before this. But in effect, the person who is nominated gets to pick his or her own running mate. And that's the person he or she wants to be vice president. Now we have the party nominee and the person they have chosen as their running mate. And they create what's called a ticket. So when we as voters go into the voting booth and cast our vote, we are voting for basically a package deal. If you want to vote for the Republican, you're going to vote for that person and his or her running mate. If you'd like to vote for the Democratic side, same thing. You're going to vote for that person and then his or her running mate. So you can see in 2012, if you wanted to vote for Mitt Romney for president, you were also voting for Ryan for vice president. And the same thing on the Democratic side, if you wanted to vote for Obama, you are also voting for Biden for vice president. And so one thing to consider for the nominee from each party is how does that person pick a vice president? There's a lot of different strategies out there. You can see through history the various choices that people have made. So for example, in 2008, Barack Obama did not have a ton of national level or international level political experience. And so he chose someone who was a little bit more experienced than him, dealt with many important committees in the Senate. He picked Joe Biden, and they created the Democratic ticket of 2008. So similarly, in 1960, John Kennedy was not viewed very favorably in the South. And so his running mate was Lyndon Baines Johnson, a Texan, 
who was seen as a Southerner and helped John Kennedy win many of the Southern states. Another interesting choice is in 2008 when John McCain, the Republican nominee, chose Sarah Palin as his running mate. She was the governor of Alaska at the time. Many people look at that choice and say that John McCain was not being viewed very favorably by women voters. And so in an attempt to gain more women favorable to the Republican Party, he went out and chose Sarah Palin as his running mate. So you'll see there is some strategy behind why people choose the running mates that they do. Sometimes it's to complement an area of strength that the nominee has. Sometimes it's to fill a gap or a weakness that the nominee may think they have in order to make their ticket stronger in the next election. So at the national convention, each party is going to write a platform. And this is a document where each party states what they actually stand for. So think of the physical platform. You know, it's something you stand on. You maybe give a speech from it. Each political party is going to write out their platform. They're going to say where they stand on many of the important issues of the next election. And each position or an issue is called a plank. And so if you really want to know what the Republican candidate thinks it's probably best to ignore all of the ads on TV, radio, internet, etc. It's probably best to go to the Republican national platform. This is where they have coherently and thoughtfully written down where they stand on each issue. Where does the Republican and where does the Democrat candidate stand on the issue of immigration, education, tax reform, jobs, the economy, energy, you can go to these party platforms and see where each party really stands on an issue. After the conventions, after they've written their party platforms, then these two nominees from the two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, have to go out and campaign. Because now we're heading toward what we call the general election. And this is where we have one Democrat versus one Republican, plus all the different other smaller third parties that might be vying for that office also. But when it comes down to it, these candidates now need to go out and cross the nation and campaign on their own behalf and say, I am the better candidate for the office of president because of X, Y, or Z. So what we're looking at here is an electoral map of the United States, where each state is shown with its electoral vote count. While we have another podcast on the Electoral College and how that exactly works, take a look at this map. Which states have the most electoral votes? And that would seem to make sense as to where each person is going to spend a lot of their time campaigning. If the magic number to win the presidency is 270 electoral votes, what would happen if a candidate wins California or Texas, Pennsylvania, New York, or Florida? You can see whoever wins those states tends to be pretty far along on their way to getting that magic number of 270. So once the parties have chosen their nominee at their national convention and they've written their platform to say, here's what we really stand for this election cycle, then candidates need to go out and start campaigning and consider where are they going to go. Now, throughout the campaign trail, each candidate is probably going to go to various places where they think they can drum up the most support. They're going to go to the places where they know they're going to get votes. For example, the Democratic candidates are definitely going to go to New York and California to secure those votes. The Republican candidates are probably going to spend more time in the South, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, etc. But then both candidates are going to vie for those what we call swing states, States that sometimes vote more Democratic and sometimes vote more conservative. For example, Virginia, North Carolina, Nevada, Colorado. Both the Democratic and the Republican candidates are going to spend a lot of time in those battleground states where if they put on a good show for their voters and for maybe some people who aren't sure, maybe those states give their electoral votes to those candidates this election cycle. So while many times the campaigning is just in the form of political speeches at various rallies, there are definitely televised presidential debates. And it's usually a series of debates where the Republican and the Democratic candidate go head to head on certain issues. The past couple of years, it's been a three or four part series where each debate evening is focused on one topic. So for example, the first night might be, hey, tell us about your domestic policies. What are you going to do for us within the United States? 
And then maybe the next night, a week later, each candidate's going to talk about what they're going to do internationally or with foreign affairs. The point of these is to try to give the public a view of both candidates in the same room talking directly to each other on the same issues. And so number eight, that is the general election. So this happens the first Tuesday in November. So the first Tuesday in November in 2016, the first Tuesday in November in 2020 will be the general presidential elections. And so again, we have a more detailed podcast on how the electoral vote actually works. But in short, each person from around the nation goes in and votes. And most Americans tend to vote for either the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate, hence the idea that we call this a two-party system. And each person's vote is counted as a popular vote, meaning of the people. But then each state looks at how many people voted for each candidate. And whichever candidate wins the most popular vote in each state, that state gives all of its electoral votes to that candidate. So for example, let's look at Colorado in the upper right. In 2012, 50% plus one Coloradans gave their vote to the Democratic candidate, hence blue. And in that case, it was Obama. Therefore, since it is a winner-take-all system, all nine electoral votes of Colorado went into Obama's tank. And again, the number that he was looking for is 270. So whichever candidate, Democrat or Republican, most likely, wins 270 votes, they are named president. They have that office for the next four years. And then if they have won only one term, they are allowed to run for re-election for a second term for a maximum number of eight years. So that's about it for this. We just wanted to give some general information about the two parties, kind of where they came from but then also to talk through the process of those two candidates running for the office of president every four years. It's a pretty complicated process, very long, very dense, seemingly getting longer and longer every election cycle. But we just wanted to give you guys some background on that and see if we could start the process of learning a little bit more. So as always, if you have any questions, please bring those into class. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and we will see you soon.